All right. Well, welcome back to Grace, where we're doing a midweek study. Uh, we're going to jump into week one of seven, talking through the seven signs of Jesus in the Gospel of John. And so, let me uh, let me give you some background, I guess, of, of what we're going to be talking about, what this series is about. So think about this. We all see signs everywhere. Recently, I was just going to North Carolina, and on the way down, I saw signs for I-79, then eventually I-77. There were the signs for West Virginia. There were the signs for Virginia. There were the signs for North Carolina. I knew I was getting close. There were the signs for Chick-fil-A, which I was definitely looking for because I was hungry, and a gas station. And then eventually, there was a sign for Moxville, North Carolina. And that's where my destination was. And I knew once I saw that, I was getting close. Well, in the Gospel of John... That's exactly what Jesus is doing. Jesus is giving us signs of what is yet to come. Signs that are talking about Jesus and what he's revealing and and where he's coming from. And that way we can understand who he is, why he's come, and better yet, understand his full glory. You see, these signs are very important when we choose to spend some time with them and understand them. And when I say signs, hopefully on your way in you got a a, a handout. Uh, there are some fill in the blanks. The first one is sign. What is a sign? A sign is an event that attests to the identity of Jesus as Messiah and Son of God that leads unbelievers to faith. That's what a sign is. It, it's specifically in John to say, here, pause. This is who Jesus is. And it's hopefully going to direct those that don't believe into being a believer. Because these are things that he's going to do that definitely should get our attention. But they have a greater meaning. And that's really the purpose of this series is to truly understand that. So over the next seven weeks, we're going to talk through these seven signs. And I placed them on that handout so you'd have those. And if you want to read in advance what those signs are, you can definitely do that. But today we're going to talk about Jesus turning water into wine. Next week, Jesus clearing the temple. The third sign, healing the official son. Fourth sign, healing the invalid. Fifth sign, feeding the multitude. Week six of the series, healing the man born blind. And week seven, raising Lazarus. And these seven signs, well, guess what? Not everybody agrees on. (laughs) You'd think they'd be pretty obvious, but some people don't put in, some scholars don't put in Jesus clearing the temple. Instead, they leave that one out and place Jesus walking on water. Well, when you look at John, he doesn't say that's a sign, walking on water, but he says cleansing the temple is. So there's some different structures with that. Some people leave both of those out and actually use six of these. They don't put Jesus clearing in the temple, and they use Jesus rising from the grave as the seventh sign. So there's all kind of discussions and and views on this, and we've chosen these seven, the predominant view, But also, these seven definitely tell about Jesus, about his kingdom, about his coming, and more importantly, about his glory. And that's really where we want to spend time. And if we get a chance at some point, we might do some extra videos that that talk about Jesus walking on water or the resurrection and, and talk about some of those. But these ones are key. And John labels all of these as signs. In fact, There are other miracles, there are other signs, there are other wonders. In in John, at the end of his gospel, in John 20, verse 30, he says, there are many other signs, there are many other wonders, but there's just not enough room. And these seven are the ones that John said, man, you you really should pay attention to these seven. And he outlined them for us. The thing is, to understand, is all seven of these that we're going to talk about occur in the first 11 chapters of John. So in the first half of John. And so today... We want to begin with the first sign. And the first sign we find in the second chapter of John. And before we turn, let me pray. Oh, gracious Father, we thank you for the opportunity to just dig into your word, to learn more about you, Lord, but more importantly, to read the, the Bible signs of, of who you are, why you came, and your purpose, and more importantly, the glory and the understanding of the kingdom that you were bringing. Lord, I just ask your presence to guide us and lead us tonight with your spirit, and may these words about Jesus, you, turning water into wine, just illuminate for us so that we truly understand something more about you tonight. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, grab a Bible, grab your favorite Bible app, and we want to turn to the book of John, the Gospel of John. 
and we want to look at John chapter 2. So the Gospel of John chapter 2. And we want to look at the first 11 verses of John chapter 2. I'm going to read from the NIV. John writes this, On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. And when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. And then he told them, Now draw out, draw some out, and take it to the master of the banquet. Well, they did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. And the disciples believed in him. So let me define or discuss the setting of what we're seeing here. This is early, very early in Jesus' public ministry. In fact, John says that there's only four or even five disciples that have been called. They would be Andrew, Peter, Philip, and Nathaniel, for sure. At the end of chapter 1, and as we get into chapter 2, it talks about this week of time that has taken place. You know, it says right here in the verse first, on the third day, what he's talking about is the third day of this week that, that started earlier in the week, and now there's this wedding as you progress through the week. A lot of scholars uh, try to make an assumption there. It says, on the third day, Jesus did something. Just like on the third day later, he's going to rise from the grave. That's just coincidental here. He's, he's actually describing this week. And we're informed of this wedding celebration that is occurring. And the wedding happened to be in a place called Cana. So this was about eight miles north of Nazareth. So as we look at this, it's kind of a guess because it doesn't really exist that way today. Yet Nathaniel was known to be from Cana. And so it's close to Nazareth, close to where Jesus and his family grew up. It's close to, to this area. Now, it says in that first verse that Jesus' mother was there. Notice it doesn't say Mary. It doesn't ever say her name. It just says Jesus' mother. Her name is not important to this, but the fact that she is the mom of Jesus is important. Jesus and his disciples are also there. So this could infer us to believe that maybe they're visiting family. This is a, a wedding that, that family are, are part of or a very close friend. The fact that Jesus is invited shows that his public ministry is, is, is growing. And if he's not family, it's normal to invite a rabbi along with their disciples to a wedding. You would want that guest of honor. So we're not exactly sure at this point. But we may have another clue that this is a family wedding. Look back at verse 5. It says, His mother, this would be the mother of Jesus, said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now, a woman in that culture wouldn't have a lot of authority, yet this woman, the mother of Jesus, tells servants at this wedding to do whatever this man, Jesus, tells you. And so you would think that she has some role, it's family, it's connection. These servants are told to listen to her for some reason if she ever comes to them. And more than likely, this is considered to be some sort of family connection to Jesus' mother, Mary. Jesus could be cousins, could be relatives, friends, family. Okay? not a stranger. So just a little bit of background about the setting of the location, the situation of what's going on. It seems simple enough. Now we also need to understand a bit about weddings in that culture. They're a little different than us. Weddings in that culture would last typically about seven days. They were festivals, they were celebrations, and it was all about hospitality. You, you would give the best, you would show your guests all the preferential treatment, roll out the red carpets for the entire week. 
In some events, uh, or some of these weddings, it would actually be more than immediate family. You would invite the entire town to the wedding. You would invite all the greatest officials, all the greatest people. Because you could have hundreds, if not a thousand people attending this wedding. And you, as the family putting the wedding on, you would want to show off everything. And it would be all about hospitality, all about the best. And for this wedding, we're unsure of the number of people in attendance, but we do know that Mary, the mother of Jesus, is there, that Jesus is there with his disciples, and there are some servants, and there's a master of the banquet, there's a few folks there, there's a bride, there's a bridegroom. Outside of that, we don't know the exact number of people. But we quickly learn about the problem. So on your sheet there, verse 3 tells us the problem. They are out of wine. Oh, no, right? What are we going to do? Now, for us, we're like, okay, well, they're out of wine. What's that matter? In that culture, wine is important. Wine is important. In fact, it says right there in verse 3, it says, When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, so Mary would say to her son Jesus, they have no more wine. Mary's the one that approaches Jesus on this. And they're not running out. It's not like, oh, we're getting low. They're out. This would be like us going out here locally on a Friday to JJ's Lighthouse in Farrell and finding out the fish is all gone. They're out. There's no more. This would be us back in 2020 going to the stores to buy toilet paper and only to find out it's out. It's gone. There's no more. This is not good. It's not good because if you're out of wine at a banquet and you're all about hospitality, you would be ridiculed. You would be publicly shamed. You would be publicly humiliated. The family, this would be talked about. And again, it's all about hospitality. The wine is served and there's no more. This is huge. And friends, it wasn't about the fact that there's no wine. It's just now you can't entertain your guests. Now the hospitality is is shot. Embarrassing, shameful. In fact, the bride, her family, would think that, whoa, we just made a big mistake allowing our daughter, Mary, into this family that cannot provide for a wedding. How are they going to provide for a family? How are they going to provide for our daughter? So it would extend culturally that far. You don't want this. Scholars have looked at that verse in a couple different ways. And I came across this, and I I was quite intrigued by it. They said this, that wine is seen as a sign of joy and blessing from God. You can read through the Old Testament. It talks about wine in abundance, and it talks about God's blessing being upon that. And so without wine, that also shows that that community, that culture, may not have a blessing of God anymore. Keep that in mind. May not have a blessing of God. And it might symbolize Israel having this spiritual blindness, which is why Jesus came. Okay, so this road sign that might be being portrayed or coming in. But let's get back to verse 3. Why would Mary care about this? Why would she go to Jesus? Why would she care? If this was her immediate family, she would not want them to be shamed. She would not want them to be embarrassed. That's why. If she was just an ordinary guest, why would she care? She would be one thing. Oh, look at them. Talk, you know, she would spread those rumors. Look, they ran out of wine. So the fact that she notices, the fact that she goes to Jesus, more than likely tells us, again, that she is family and, and, and or good friends and doesn't want to see the shame, the public shame, the humiliation. And she goes to Jesus and says... They have no more wine. Why would she say that? Well, Jesus is her firstborn. He's male. He can hopefully do something about this. Maybe he has that ability. Jesus' family, if Mary's family, Jesus would be family. And obviously, Jesus wouldn't want them to be shamed either. And Jesus could have responded in a couple ways. One, oh, that's too bad. That would mean he doesn't have any family ties. He doesn't do that. Jesus could have said, I'm going to run down to the local winery and grab some more. Not likely. Didn't exist as wineries. You would have to spend a lot of time and effort gathering and collecting wine. Jesus could have said, hey, what do you want me to do about it? We just know that's not Jesus. 
But his response, take a look there in the next verse, in verse 4. His response is unique. He says, woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. Now, with our ears here in 2022, when we read this and we see this, when we hear the word woman, it triggers, triggers a negative response. It sounds sarcastic. I know if I stated to my mom, woman, why do you involve me? I would be questioned. I possibly would be smacked or inappropriate. What did you just say? Right? But that's not what Jesus is saying here. Believe it or not, he's not insulting his mother. He's not being degrading at all. This was common language at that time. And Jesus himself uses this later on. In John 19, Jesus says while he's on the cross, woman, here's your son. He uses the same term, and it's actually a term of endearment. Even though Jesus is Mary's son, Jesus is Mary's Lord, and we tend to forget that. Even though Jesus is Mary's son, he's also Mary's Lord, just like Jesus is our Lord. Therefore, he doesn't have to refer to her as mom, because she, like all of us, is a sinner in need of a Savior. And so he uses this colloquial term that's not insulting at all. It's, it's woman. Yet, that's not the beginning part that should catch our attention. It's really the end part of what Jesus says there. And on your study guide, it's that last part. Jesus replies, my hour has not yet come. Jesus' response to his mom was not no. It wasn't, I'll get on that right away. Jesus' response is, I came here for a greater purpose. I'm here not to turn water into wine. I'm here for a greater purpose, and my hour has not yet come to reveal that in complete public display. That actually doesn't happen until we get to Palm Sunday with the shouts of Hosanna and Jesus coming in on that donkey. So this is well before that. Now, Jesus does eventually address the problem, but he does in a way to give God the glory and all the recognition. And so he focuses our attention. He says, my hour to do all this, my hour to show all this, my hour of why I've actually come into the world hasn't come yet. And so he wasn't reprimanding his mother. He wasn't being sarcastic. He wasn't insulting her. He was reminding her and reminding us that he's actually come for a much greater purpose. Verse 5, Mary says to the servants, again, back to that verse I mentioned in the beginning, do whatever he tells you. She tells these servants to do whatever Jesus says. And here's as I was preparing this. I'm like, man, that's a great verse. We should post that everywhere and look at that daily. Do whatever Jesus tells you. Because Jesus tells us a lot of things. And this isn't the only time we should be listening to Jesus. The servants are getting a glimpse saying, do whatever he tells you. Mary assumes that Jesus is going to do something with his response saying, woman, why do you bother me? My hour has not yet come. She just doesn't know what he's going to do. And Jesus, at this point, decides to really change things up. He's about ready to take something that is old and show us something new. He's about ready to to take something that was culturally necessary and tell us it's no longer necessary. He's about ready to start a new beginning with what he's about ready to do. And a lot of times we miss that in this narrative. We miss that of what Jesus is actually doing here. And so we're going to spend a little time looking at this. Take a look at verse 6. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. So we need to understand this because in our culture we don't have ceremonial washing jars. And so what is Jesus, why is John pointing this out? What's Jesus getting to with this? Jesus looks around and he sees these six jars. 
These are large jars. And they're called ceremonial jars. And they're made of stone. They're not made of something called clay that can become contaminated and tainted because they hadn't been fired in a kiln, but these are stone. They have been purified. They can be used over and over. And therefore, they are called ceremonial jars. They, they have a purpose for the Jews. And they serve a very specific purpose at a wedding. As guests would arrive, they would be seated at a table. And before the food comes out, they would all, as Jewish males and females, whoever is attending, would wash their hands, and they could not eat until their hands were washed. Now, that's a great thing for us to wash our hands before we eat, right? But in that culture, they didn't have running water everywhere, and so they had these ceremonial water jars that water would be dipped out, poured over the person's hands, and they would cleanse them because this water is kind of like a blessing. This water is kind of purified. This water has been been held in a, in, a, in a device that is used to purify externally, used to cleanse externally. It would be like us today having hand sanitizer before we would eat. That's the concept here. Now, Mark, a gospel writer, and if you want to write a note there, Mark chapter 7, verse 3. Mark explains this a little more for us. And so this is the beauty of looking at the Gospels. John tells us this, but the, the Word of God helps explain it because, again, we're not in that culture. Mark 7, chapter 3, it says this, The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding a tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. And so Mark tells us, hey, in this part, the disciples were eating without washing their hands. And so these Pharisees and teachers of the law and Mark were saying, hey, what are your disciples doing? They're not following the Jewish law. There's an old way of doing things. And there's a new way of doing things. And Jesus is looking at the old way of doing things as ceremonial washing of hands that come from these jars. Now, he says there were six stone water jars, each one, again, holding 20 to 30 gallons. So let's think about that for a second. There were six jars holding 20 to 30. This would show the expectation of the number of guests. In other words, they have 120, somewhere between 120 and 180 gallons of water to wash hands before you eat. That's significant. That's a lot of water to wash hands. And they don't have running water. There's no hoses. They would have to take other buckets and fill these jars, but you couldn't do that because those other buckets would be contaminated. They wouldn't be purified. They were not made of stone. So they would typically have to take these stone jars out of the house, somewhere in the, the community, fill them, and bring them back because the water had to be purified. You can't contaminate the water. This is the washing of the hands. It's, again, these Jewish laws, these Jewish rituals, these customs. So they're expecting a lot of guests at this wedding. So the stone water jars would be permanently clean, and they're tied with the concept of purification. When you wash, you're now purified, you're able to eat. Hopefully you're following me all on that there. So I want to introduce a new segment in teaching called Math Time because I was fascinated by this, and I wanted to just put this in our perspectives, and I, and I have some of these on your sheet, and, and so I want you to kind of follow along with me. So, six jars, 20 to 30 gallons per jar equals 120 to 100, 180 gallons. So, a gallon for us is a gallon of milk. That's what we can think of in our minds. Think of 120 to 180 gallons of milk. You know, when you go to a grocery store and you see a whole cooler filled up, that's still probably not 120, 180 gallons of milk when you first see it. It might be 60, it might be 80. Okay? So that's a lot of, lot of water. Putting it in perspective for today, an average 10-minute shower uses 20 to 25 gallons. So if you were going to take a shower, this, this is enough water for six showers. Now, today, just, again, putting these numbers in perspective for us so we can understand Today, when we wash our hands for 10 seconds, 
it uses 0.2 gallons of water. 0.2. If we use the birthday song and actually do 30 seconds like we're supposed to, it uses 0.7 gallons of water. Again, these are averages. But just to show you, for us washing our hands today, 0.7 gallons of water if we spend 30 seconds. Okay. Let me take it a little further, because we know that Jesus turns this water into wine, as, as we read already, and this is the main premise. The average glass of wine that is served for dinner, five ounces of wine. So when you order a glass of wine for dinner at a restaurant, they're going to give you roughly five ounces. Don't you love math time? Isn't this so good? So, one gallon is equal to 128 ounces. One, two, eight, 128 ounces, which would equate to 25 glasses of wine per gallon. All right, now is really where we get some big numbers. So, if we were to have 120 gallons of wine, that would equate to 3,000. In 72, 3072 glasses of wine from 120 gallons. 3,000 glasses, you know, 3,072. If we had 180 gallons, again, these jars were somewhere between 20 and 30 gallons, it would equate to 4,608 glasses of wine. 4,608. If you had 300 guests, and they each had three glasses of wine during your festivity that night, that would be 900 glasses of wine. They had enough for 3,072 or 4,608, so let's just say 3,500, 4,000 glasses of wine. If they had 300 guests eat, drinking three glasses each, it's only 900. So that's a lot of wine, a lot of water. They got turned into wine. It's a huge amount. Math time. Got to love it. Because it helps put Scripture in perspective. When we pause and really think about the amount of water, the amount of holding tanks. And Jesus says to his servants, that are there, not his servants, but the servants that were there for the, the wedding, the servants that Mary, sorry, the mother of Jesus, told the servants, right? He said to them in verse 7, Fill the jars with water. So they filled it to the brim. Again, this would not be an easy task. Depending on if it was 20 gallons or 30 gallons, just a slight more math. Think about this for a second. A 20-gallon stone water jar filled to the brim with water would weigh 167 pounds. If it was a 30-gallon, it would weigh 250 pounds, plus the weight of the jar, which would be significant as well. So you're talking probably 180 to 270 pounds, each jar, and there's six of them. And Jesus says, go out and fill them to the brim and bring them back. It's not, again, they don't just hook the hose up. They, they don't bring the water truck in. They've got to go get that water from a well or cistern or something and fill these ceremonial purified stone ceremonial water jars. We don't know how they did it. We don't know where they did it. And I guarantee you, if you're anything like me, when you fill these to the brim, you spill them all over the place in their light. Take a gallon pitcher. I spill it. And they have... 20 to 30 gallons of water in here. The point being, Jesus takes what was used for purification, the ceremonial washing jars filled with water. He takes something used for purification, old, and he makes it into something brand new, a celebration, the new way. He's, he's Taking these old jars, this old process of purification, he's saying, no, we're going to turn it into something completely new. We're going to turn it into wine. Jesus repurposes the jars for his purpose in God's glory. Something greater. Verse 8. Then Jesus told them, now draw out 
draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. To help us picture this a little bit, behind me are five five-gallon water coolers. It's a lot of water. And that's only one stack. There would be six of these. Just to kind of put perspective volume, how much we're talking about. So imagine six of these across the stage. And when you fill this up, one of these, again, is somewhere between 180 and 270 pounds. This is equivalent to 25 gallons right here. And Jesus says, when they bring these back filled with water, he says, now I want you to take some of it out. Draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And it says they did so. So think of this situation. You're the servant. You were told to do whatever Jesus says. You go and do this. You fill these ceremonial jars up with water. You heard that they're out of wine. And Jesus says, okay, now draw some water out of there. Well, he just says draw some out. Notice he doesn't use the word water. Draw some out and then take it to the master of the banquet. And you got to be thinking, I'm going to get fired over this. This crazy guy just told us to spend. We just busted our butts to try to fill these hand-washing jars with water. Now he's saying, take some of that out and go give it to the master of the banquet to drink. Look at their response. They did so. Complete obedience. Complete obedience. They did so. We have to understand who the master of the banquet is. Typically, this would be somebody in the family, somebody who is in charge, uh, somebody who is overseeing the festivities, the wedding. They were responsible for all the hospitality so that the bride and groom and the family didn't have to worry about it. They're the ones looking out on behalf. They're like the wedding host and the coordinator that we would hire today for our weddings. This would be a key person to make sure everything is working smoothly. They're the ones that are holding the family's reputation on the line. They would have to have some panic because they're running, not running out of wine. Mary says they're out of wine. The guests would have started to murmur, where's the wine? We're out of wine. And the master of the banquet would be completely responsible for the hospitality. The servants draw water, what they think is water, out of these jars. And they take it to the main guy to drink. Like, think about that. Like, seriously, Jesus, you want us to take this water that we just put in here. We saw it. We put it in there. We put it in there all the time. We put it in as water, we pull it out, it's water, we wash hands with it, it's water. You want us to take that water and give it to the master of the banquet and say, hey, we found some new wine, would you like to try it? That good hand-washing water wine, right? It has to be a lower quality than the other wine, for sure, because it's water. This is a mixture of that old new that I talked about earlier that Jesus is bringing in on your sheet. The old new, the external purification, washing of hands, Jesus is saying that's no longer needed. And we see that with his disciples. They don't need to do that later on. Like this is repeated over and over. That external process of washing your hands is not needed, but an internal process. The word there is internal. An internal process of purification is needed now. And the source only comes from God. The source only comes from God, only comes from Jesus. Jesus said, go get water, and now he's repurposed it for something greater, something new. Verse 9. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine, and he did not realize where it had come from, though, come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside. Somebody sent me a, a meme today that shows Jesus with his disciples going into a restaurant, and he says, 
All right, everybody, just order water, and he winks at them. (laughs) Think about that for a second. Here's Jesus telling them to go and give whatever was in this ceremonial washing jar for your hands to drink. He's repurposing those jars for something greater, for his purpose and his glory. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that is now wine. Did Jesus touch it? No, never says that. Did Jesus say, Alakazam? Bippity boppity boo? Did he wave his finger? Nothing. Did he even bless it? The master of ceremonies tastes wine. In order to make wine, there's an extensive fermentation process that must occur to turn the grape or blueberry or whatever you're creating into wine to turn that into wine. There's a process. And all of a sudden, the water that was just filled up in these ceremonial washing jars is wine. It takes time, but not when Jesus is involved. Not when Jesus is trying to show something greater. Not when Jesus is trying to just give us a glimpse of what he is capable of doing and who he is and why he's come. And within minutes of drawing this water, the master of the banquet drinks wine. Jesus' command, go, give this to the master of the banquet, was to show the person, the master of the banquet, who's really in charge. Because they now have wine. And he would have known they would have been out. It's his responsibility, again, to figure this out. A second thing, Jesus wants the master of the banquet to taste and see that the Lord is good. Just a sampling. Now, the master of the banquet should know everything about the situation and celebration, but who knows more than the master of the banquet right now? The servants. Because the servants know who is responsible. The master of the banquet doesn't. The bride and the bridegroom doesn't. The guests don't. And this is actually, when we read this, said the master of the banquet tasted the water and he did not realize where it had come from, though the servants knew. Then the master of the banquet called the bridegroom aside. The groom. This is the first time we see the groom at this wedding. So if if the groom is the center of attention at this wedding... Well, first, the center of attention was Jesus. Then we learned about the master of the banquet. Now we've learned about the groom. So it's kind of telling us the importance of who is there. The groom is important, but not as important as Jesus being there. And Jesus really is fulfilling the role of the master of the banquet. He's the one in charge. He's the one making sure Things are going off well. He's the one providing hospitality. He's the one in complete control and aware of everything that's going on. Jesus is giving everyone at that wedding just a small glimpse of why he's come. Scholars will take this narrative of John chapter 2 and connect it, and I have this on the outline because it's very important. They will connect it to Revelation 19, starting at verse 7. Revelation 19, verse 7, deals with you and I. If we choose to follow, if we choose to believe, if we choose to trust in Jesus, there is a great banquet that Jesus is throwing and inviting all of us, his bride. Revelation 19, 7 says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, And his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. This would be the righteousness, the the clean cleansing of the sin, everything for us. Fine linen strands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. And then the angel said to me, write this. And again, John's writing Revelation as well. Write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. At one point, we will be the guests. At one point, we will be welcomed. We will actually be participating in this great wedding banquet that is going to be thrown. This is just a foreshadow of what Jesus is able to do 
And if he's able to turn water into wine, don't you think he could take our sins away and make us white as snow and allow us to be with him forever? Take a look at verse 10. It says that he called the bridegroom aside, and this would be the master of the banquet, calling the bridegroom, and he said to him, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after. The guests have had too much to drink. But you, you have saved the best till now. This wasn't any wine. This was the best wine. The choice wine, the wine that was even better than the first. And typically when you throw a party, you have hospitality, you want everybody to say, ooh, this is the best wine I've ever had. And then as they continue to drink, you're like, I don't want to serve them good wine. They're just going to get drunk and they're not going to remember the taste of this wine. So I'm going to serve them the cheaper wine later. But Jesus, well, that's not the way he works. He wants it to keep getting better and better and better. And so Jesus reverses that picture and the the master of the banquet recognized that. He says, and he thinks that the, the bridegroom is responsible for this. And he says, you have saved the best wine until now. Nobody else does that. How great of a host you are. What hospitality, what care, what compassion that you're saving the best for us. And the master of banquet's referring to the bridegroom, yet the actual bridegroom at that wedding has nothing to do with this. Because the actual bridegroom here is Jesus. And he's the one that's provided it. He's providing it. Jesus is that bridegroom. Who knew that Jesus did it? The mother of Jesus, who's not named, Mary. The disciples that were there. And the servants. Small group, small amount of people see this. And we see that throughout Jesus' ministry. Small people, small groups of people see it, and he says, it's not time yet. My hour has not come yet. So just keep it to yourselves. Know what I'm able to do. Verse 11. What Jesus did here in all of Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. The first of the signs. Jesus then had not done any signs before this. Up until this point, he's living an ordinary human life, fully God, fully, fully man, yet he hadn't revealed these kind of things of what he's capable of doing. Again, what did he do? He took 120 to 180 gallons of water that can serve up to 4,000 plus glasses of wine. He turned that water into that wine. Significant quantity, but don't stop there. The, the most high quality. He's taking what's old, and he's also making it brand new. Taking these old ceremonial hand-washing jars, saying, nope, you don't need to be cleansed externally anymore. What you need to be do is cleansed internally. There's something greater that you need to be, be recognizing. He reveals his glory, his divine presence. And get this, it says right there at the end of 11, and his disciples believed in him. Just shortly, again, four or five, they followed him. Peter and these guys from the boats, they followed Jesus. Jesus says, hey, come follow me. And they do. But now they start to believe in him because of this sign, just this first sign. But we know how they also forget a short period of time. They see, they hear and see Jesus tell the servants, fill it to the brim. And now the master of the banquet says, there's the best wine ever. He takes the ceremonial jars, fills them with wine. Purification no longer needed externally, rather internally. And the true cleansing no longer required water, but rather a cleansing in the spirit. That's what he's getting to. And it's a small taste of what is yet to come. Because he again says, my time has not yet come. So this is what scholars and theologians say is already not yet. Jesus is giving us a glimpse, but it's not yet. He's here now with us and living in us and dwelling in us with his Holy Spirit, but we don't get the full glory yet. It's already here. His kingdom is already here, but it's just not yet because he hasn't fulfilled his return of coming back and establishing his kingdom eternally. 
the most important thing is spiritual blindness is now replaced with vision. His disciples are believing in him. No doubt Mary believed in him. No doubt the servants believed in him. Key point, I have it on there. Jesus is able and willing to provide abundantly for the needs of his people. Did they need enough wine for 4,000 glasses? No, <laughs> Jesus is just showing off. And that was just a, just a little bit of what he's capable of doing in a very short period of time. Powerful. He's able, he's willing to provide abundantly. It's a key part of this first sign that we need to understand and we need to believe as followers and believers. This is part of that road sign. Imagine if you see Jesus is able and willing to provide abundantly for anything and everything you need. If you just leave here with that tonight, you will have hope more than you came in here with. As I close, I want to just read something I read from this scholar, commentator, Edward Klink from the ECMT Commentary. He says this, The wedding in Cana of Galilee, with its wedding party waiting to have their hands washed and their wine replenished, is like the world that has not known that the God of creation is the way, the truth, and the life. The church, the bride of Christ, has enjoined herself to the true bridegroom, bridegroom and awaits the real celebration to begin. The church's existence in the world is like being one of the servants in that wedding who knows who the true bridegroom is but is surrounded by the people who are unaware. The church, us, we're, we're like those servants who are at that wedding who, who know who the true bridegroom is, got to see Jesus for who he is, but we're surrounded by people who are completely unaware. And so the church, seeing the things unseen, must now navigate itself as both a witness to the wedding of God, and as a faithful partner in partnership with, with God, awaiting a reunion with the bridegroom. In other words, we've got work to do to share this news of this sign. And he follows up, and I put this at the very end of, of your handout. We have witnessed the sign, and this sign points us that Jesus is the Almighty God. Who else but God could do this amazing transformation. Jesus is the bridegroom. He is the one who's going to throw an amazing wedding banquet for all of us, his bride. Jesus provides abundance to those who serve him. Abundance to those who serve him. Again, the servants serve Jesus, right? And he provided it in abundance. And Jesus' time was not yet. But this sign gives us a glimpse of his power and his authority of what's yet to come. Let me pray. Oh, Father, we thank you so much that we just pause and just dig into a passage like this. It seems like this pretty cool turn water into wine. We hear something like this all the time, but... The abundance, the, the willingness, the ability, the, the meaning, Lord, we, we take it for granted. And here you were taking these ceremonial, traditional washing of your hands, jars filled with water, and you were saying, okay, it's not about the external purification anymore. It has to go internal, and you're preparing us for this great banquet to come. Lord, thank you. Thank you for that glimpse. Thank you for just this little insight. And and thank you that, that we have the Word of God preserved for us today as a sign of what is yet to come, just to give us a glimpse. Lord, may we not take it for granted. May we see you as the Almighty God. May we see you as the Bridegroom. May we see that you provide abundance in all things. And we recognize that you're already here. And may we not miss that sign. But more importantly, like that commentator said, may we be the church that is fully aware of these signs and does everything we can to share them with those who are having trouble seeing them, just like those who were at that banquet that day. Lord, may we not be blind any longer. May we see you and see this message for what it's worth. Thank you for this first sign. 
Amen. Well, friends, thanks again. If you've never joined us, you're more than welcome to stay in a group fashion. There's uh, probably enough here.